Welcome to today's Growth Strategies Talk. I'm Adam Tritabon, International Tax Partner with RSM. Um, I also lead our tax practice um, for our North Central region, which includes our Minneapolis office. RSM is the fifth largest accounting firm um, in the U.S. and the largest accounting firm serving the audit, tax, and consulting needs um, of the middle market, which we view as the, really the growth engine um, for the economy. Um, we're excited to sponsor today's event on this important topic of growth, um, especially considering these unique, uncertain, and challenging times and the importance that growth um, plays in accelerating the economy and, and companies out of, of these challenging times. Um, as we work with our clients um, to help them realize growth opportunities, we stress to our team to bring a curious attitude um, and a collaborative spirit to the conversation um, to help our clients navigate growth. Um, and I'm sure, you know, through the conversation today, you'll get great insight from our, our panelists on their strategies and approach to growth. Um, lastly, I just want to thank the presenters for their time today um, and for sharing their their experiences with the group. Um, enjoy. Well, good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Allison Kaplan. I'm the editor in chief of Twin Cities Business, and we are so delighted that you've joined us today for TCB Talks Growth Strategies. Before I introduce you to our panelists, I'd like to briefly thank our sponsors. We couldn't do this event without you. The sponsor you just heard from, of course, was RSM. RSM's purpose is to deliver the power of being understood to their clients, colleagues, and community through world-class audit, tax, and consulting services focused on middle market businesses in Minnesota and worldwide. Thanks, Adam, for, for handling that. Uh, and thank you to our promotional partner for this event, ACG Minnesota, ACG is the global community for middle market M&A deal makers and business leaders focused on driving growth to their organizations. With almost 400 members locally, a global network of 15,000 members and over 90,000 investors, owners, executives, lenders, and trusted advisors worldwide. They're the largest networking organization in the world for private equity. Well, our panelists today work in a variety of industries, as you'll soon hear, technology, engineering, services, organic spirits, but what they have in common is a proven track record of growth. Today, we're going to talk about how a business avoids that all too common plateau. How do you know when it's time to make an acquisition, to add a division, to spin one off, all without threatening the core of the company? And how do you stay the course in the midst of a pandemic like nothing any of us have ever experienced before? We've definitely got our work cut out for us. Without further ado, let's meet our panelists. Here they come. While they're getting online, let me also just mention to everybody um, as you're filing into our Zoom room, you can ask questions and post comments as we go. That's the beauty of Zoom. So feel free to, to use that chat button at the bottom of your screen or the, the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Hi guys. Hi there. Thanks for being here today. Uh, let me just go around and introduce each of you. We'll start with Mark Anderson. Mark, can you see? With, you, he, he's the one with all the beverages that we're all jealous of there in the corner. Uh, Mark was inspired by the movie Trading Places. He left North Dakota after studying aviation to begin his career in trading futures at the Minnesota, at the Minneapolis Grain Exchange. His acumen led him to launch Killer Whale Holdings, which came to control 30% of the U.S. dairy market. He then founded Captain Drake LLC, a global supplier supplier of non-GMO sugar and citrates. A serial entrepreneur, Mark launched Drake's Organic Spirits, the first organic alcohol company to achieve all five certifications. That's USDA, organic, non-GMO, project verified, gluten-free, vegan, and kosher. Way to go, Mark. Jeff Gao joined the Air Force out of high school, where he received a series of prestigious promotions. 
Afterward, he graduated from the University of North Dakota and immediately took his charismatic leadership and relentless work ethic to his first sales position at Marco. Since taking the helm at Marco, Jeff has led the company through aggressive growth and opportunities. He's transformed what started as a small typewriter dealer in 1973 into a rapidly growing technology company with offices located nationally. He's known for his friendly personality. He feels inspired by building a great workplace and supporting company growth and delivering client satisfaction. Thanks for being here, Jeff. Then the two Bretts. We'll start with Brett McKinnon. That's Brett with two T's. Brett is Senior Vice President of Sales for Sports Engine, an app that is often used on my phone and I'm sure many of yours as well. He's responsible for inside sales and enterprise business development, advertising and sponsorship sales for all of Sports Engine's competition and sports management platforms. Prior to Sports Engine, Brett held sales roles with Search Leaders LLC and See Beyond. He holds a bachelor's degree in sports management from the U of M. Last but not least, Brett Weiss, president and CEO of WSB, a design and consulting firm specializing in engineering, community planning, environmental, and construction services. Brett is one of the founders of WSB. He's in his fancy innovation room right now. He had to outdo my background. And he's worked in civil engineering com the community for more than 30 years. He believes that a strong culture drives drives results, and he inspires his team to discover through thoughtful and creative solutions and infrastructure challenges. Brett plays an active role in the Twin Cities business community by investing and actively supporting work that leads to a thriving economy. He currently serves on the board of directors of the Minnesota Chamber, the Chamber Foundation, and the Hennepin Theater Trust. He previously chaired the Leadership Minnesota program through the Minnesota Chamber, and he's a co-founder of Engineering CEOs of Minnesota. You've got your plate full. Well, thank you all for being here today. Uh, when we first reached out to you, it was way back in January. Seems like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? Um, why don't we start by talking a little bit about pre-COVID-19, pre-pandemic. How were your companies all doing in 2019? That's, that's what led you all here today. And what were you expecting 2020 to be like? Jeff, should we start with you? Sure. You know, like so many companies and even a lot of my friends that are in business, they, they're off to their, you know, great quarter followed up, you know, following a really good 2019. So for us, 2019 was another record year and it should be your growth company. You should grow every year. And so 2019 was strong at all fronts, top and bottom line. Uh, 2020, first quarter was off to an absolute fabulous start, top and bottom line. And uh, halfway through the year, we're still on track at our profit goal, but we're, we're going to come up short on revenue. So we, we, were, we did a good job, I think, in addressing, uh, getting dynamic on those costs early. Sure. Okay. Brett Weiss, how about you at WSB? Well, kind of similar. 2019 was, uh, was a very solid year for us. I will say we spent a lot of time preparing our business for the next growth uh, plateau for us. So as we've grown, we've had those periods of time where we've flattened out and we've really worked on systems and figuring out where we wanted to go. And that has spurred our rapid growth. So our growth has really happened in a series of big spurts. And we were planning that for 2020 with all of the work that we did in 2019 and was very excited about it. And it was, it was shaping up to be really good, although, you know, we, we were all a little concerned about when a recession might hit. Never really thought about a pandemic coming. Uh, but so far, 2020 has not been a terrible year, and it's really allowed us to focus on some things that we wanted to accomplish uh, that we hadn't been able to otherwise. And so uh, we tend to lag into recessions, though, and I think uh, looking to the fall and early next year is where we would have concern. But right now, we are still moving forward with, with growth. Might be a little bit different than Jeff. Our profitability might not be as good, but our growth is going to still be fairly strong this year. Great. We'll talk a little more about that. Brett McKinnon, what about Sports Engine? 
Yeah, I'll echo a lot of the similar sentiments. And first and foremost, great to be with you today, Ali. Appreciate all the work you, Sammy, and others do in the community. And then just honored to be with this group. It's a group of great CEOs and founders and entrepreneurs. So I wanted to make sure I acknowledge that. Very humbling. Uh, 19, super strong year for us, not dissimilar to the rest of the group. We've certainly seen some early headwinds coming out of March and April. Uh, within our business, I, I think the strength of our business is we're very diversified across us as well as the NBC Sports Group. And so we see strength across revenue and profitability on the back half as well. So that diversity has certainly uh, assisted us through a very challenging time. Okay, well, we'll talk a little more about some of your changes in growth in a minute. But Mark, what about you? How did you how did things look coming into this year? So 2019, we completed a private placement that was oversubscribed by three times. So coming into 2020, preparing for all the orders, we were pretty well um, on our balance sheet. Uh, kicking off the first quarter, um, started out strong. The second quarter, all bars, restaurants, and everything in the US, sports venues closed down. We did a quick pivot. We started making sanitizer using some of our uh, equipment, machinery, and lots of alcohol. And that's opened up additional revenue um, and a vertical market that now is expanding our business. And we're already having our best year ever. Wow, that's amazing. Well, great. Well, that's encouraging. Um, Brett, let's go back to Sports Engine for a minute. We know 2019 was a big year for the company. Um, you had a leadership transition as your founder exited and a new CEO, Brian Bell, took over. You also marked three straight years of, of growth. Um, what, has, what has the leadership change been like for the team? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I think as Jeff mentioned, as growth companies, we are charged with big growth year on year, no matter what. So that is a little bit of an expectation, but 2019 was certainly a banner year, really facilitated by you know, a couple key drivers. One is the, the verticalized B2B marketplace of youth sport organizations in which 10 years ago was probably a little bit of novelty of how do you go provide accessibility and technology in an affordable way through commodities and the commodity of payment. So we provide a lot of utility to use sport organizations, but we do it in a way uh, that offsets a lot of the cost to those organizations. And so that's been a real core competency and core driver for us and will continue to be in the future. So that was great. Uh, we've got a moral imperative and a big focus within the background screening and abuse prevention for youth sport coaches and athletes um, and, and volunteers more holistically. And so we spend a lot of time as that as a growth engine, but setting a standard of care across youth sport organizations that we would expect in business and other places. So it's a big driver for us. And then lastly, on the growth side, we really focused on broadening out the consumer end of our business and being more attractive to uh, our B2C audience and providing uh, applications and software and other ways to reach them for the ability to monetize. So those have been really three core drivers. But I think to your point on the question, anytime you go through transition of founders, and it's not just, you know, Justin is the founder, is the CEO and a great entrepreneur, not just similar to these gentlemen here, and a big um, inspiration in my life, you've got two other founders in Carson Kipfer and Greg Blasco, and then a very senior executive in Anna Blas and Anna Columbus, who's gone on to do great things here in our community as well. So there was certainly those four, but it was not a very well kept secret, probably internally, externally it was, we had a very well thought out succession plan over an 18 month period. And I think the testament as Brian comes in is Brian was really the face of some key compound growth over a five year period. And the team really resonated with the growth to him as well. And he's done a great job transitioning into that team. We've added some new team members across our senior leadership team, uh, which has been fantastic. And I think the, the testament to both Brian and to the people that had departed is that when the announcement came out the next day, I think business went on and you always wonder what that's going to look like. And I think that's probably the strength and definition of a great leader or leaders who've left and now leaders coming in. Right. So that, so that seems like a, a good takeaway, just having that plan in place and, and it, it didn't happen overnight. You just kept it from reporters like me, basically. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. You, yeah, you probably didn't love it. Um, but yeah, the, yeah, I think, you know, the, the team did a nice job with the plan. It was well thought out. Um, but yeah, you certainly, I think that's how we should judge ourselves, right? If the business can only persist on behalf of a great founder, you probably haven't built the thing that you think will sustain into the future. And as much as we'd like to keep that private internally uh, and keep it, you know, there's not a lot of news there. Our goal was to kind of move past it and move into the future. So we're super excited about Brian's leadership and what we have in store. 
Great. Well, on the flip side, Brett Weiss, you founded WSB in 1995. And if you look at the timeline, it's acquisition after acquisition, so much growth. You've diversified, you've, you've acquired. Has that been the strategy from the start? Talk a little bit about how you've gotten to where you are today. Well, yeah, we're, we're supposed to be celebrating our 25th anniversary. We had all kinds of things planned for, but COVID took care of that. So we'll, we'll figure that part out. But, you know, there were five of us that started the company in 1995 and um, I was 31 years old. So that'll tell you how old I am right now. But um, I, I'd be lying if I told you we knew what we were doing, right? And that we had a good plan for what it was. So I think in the very beginning, we were just trying to build a business and build a business in the way that we thought could be successful. And then we had an eye towards the future, right? Because most of our competitors were much older than us. And so we had to look different. We had to be different than everybody else. And so once you do that for a while and you start to realize that, you know, your, uh, your culture is one of innovation and trying to set new standards and, and find that why, right? That Simon Sinek why that is different than everybody else, that starts to become your culture. And that's, if you wanted to change it, you couldn't. And so for quite a while, we did not do any acquisitions and we had one office and we built a business and we thought it was, was really good. But then you start to get to that point where you look for how, to, how do you sustain this and how do you uh, make it successful going forward? And for us, that was, the, that was the plan. Our plan was never to build it up to a size and then sell out. It, you know, in our service industry, it's a little bit different. Uh, from that standpoint, you can do that, but that was, we felt that there was a need to have a privately held business in our space that would allow employees to do the things that they need to do to be really successful. So the acquisitions really came as we looked at new services that we wanted to provide or new markets that we wanted to go in. And you get to a point where you realize that you can try to go hire somebody and then build that, or you can go buy a little bit of that new service area or that new market. And then you go with the organic growth. So if you look at our total growth over the years, it's maybe been 8% uh, acquisition and the rest of it has been organic growth with us hiring people. But those acquisitions have been really critical to entering markets or service areas that have allowed us to get a jump start, and then we can fill in with staff. And once we have a little bit of a toehold, we're able to, to build that out. So uh, it wasn't necessarily a strategy. Some people do it because it looks like, well, that's a fun thing to do, or that's what I should be doing because that's what, it, and they're not fun necessarily, right? And they're really hard and they take a lot of work. But at the end of the day, if you do it right, our latest one was a company in Houston and they've been fantastic. And it's been a real success story for us in, in that market and uh, for our company and what they bring to the organization. So we go in and say, you bring the good stuff to us, right? We don't need, we're not gonna change everything to our way or to your way, but let's combine the great uh, decision making and processes and procedures. And that's really helped us uh, to launch our company forward. That's great. I don't know, Jeff Gao, you seem to make acquisitions look like fun. You've done how many of them? Have you lost count at this point? We've done, I, I don't, I keep track because um, they're all different. 46 so far. Yeah. Well, so to talk about that. I mean, how you, you started out, like we said, as a typewriter company. You're now a $400 million plus company. 46 acquisitions. How did you embark on that path? Well, first of all, it starts with a commitment to growth. And that's why we're here today, all of us talking about growth. Because a lot of people talk about growth because it's more fun than shrinking. Why wouldn't they, right? And so, but if you're going to commit to it, there's a couple ways you can do it. Brett, Brett gave a good summary on that. You can, you can have a growth strategy tied to organic growth, which means you grow within your organization, or you can, you can be acquisition-based. Each by themselves has its own benefits and, and you know positives and negatives to it. You can't just buy a bunch of companies, stick, up, stick them together and call that good. That seldom works. And to Brett's point, um, I like to buy companies and then you start your organic growth there by getting a, a stronghold in a marketplace. So acquisitions are part of an overall growth strategy. We try to balance that about 50-50. So our, our typical strategy, we, we buy a copier company and copier companies, even though that's not a real dynamic industry, they got a lot of customers under contract. So you get that benefit. And then once you've got the client uh, acquired and you're in your labor force, then you can add on to that, or IT services, your other services that you provide. So 
the, the catalyst for growth has certainly been, or for acquisitions, has been new markets. Sometimes it's new categories. We bought shredding companies because that's adjacent to some of the other categories that we do. But an ideal, an ideal fit for us would be in market, something you could integrate into either an existing office perhaps, or if you don't have, a, if it's a new market, you establish a beachhead there. For example, we, uh, we'd, we'd consolidated quite a bit in the upper Midwest and we were known as an acquisition company. We're not tire kickers. So inside the industry, people are gonna reach out for us um, as an option, but out, out East when we wanted to um, establish our presence out there, we made a, a fairly large acquisition, our largest actually. And so now we're kind of doing the same thing out there. So that, that, that's our strategy, buy, grow, and um, don't break the good stuff and try to fix some of the things that need it. You make it sound so easy. Mark, you've taken a, a slightly different strategy to, to growth and building a, a company from the ground up. Talk a little bit about how, you, how you've done it and so quickly. Well, um, the alcohol industry isn't my background. It's food and beverage ingredients. And uh, Drake's Organic originated from the production of organic alcohol for the flavor extract companies that needed organic alcohol to produce organic extracts. Um, in 2016, we realized that with all the certifications that we provided for the food and beverage industry, organic, non-GMO, vegan, gluten-free, and kosher, there was no other Bev Elk company that provided that in the space of beverage alcohol. So 2017, we launched Drake's Organic Spirits in the U.S. Um, the alcohol industry is very complex with uh, different legalities in each state uh, upon federal regulations as well. You must go through distributors that are set up. So it's complex, but um, we've been nimble. Um, the way that we set up our company has been don't invest in the brick and mortar, invest in the supply chain and distribution, stay nimble, be able to move quick. Um, we've been innovative. We've been the leader in a lot of different categories in the Bev Elk space that have other followers, but we're the leader and um, we're still the top producer of, and still the only producer of the five certified um, cert certifications that we have in the alcohol industry. That's amazing. Um, so, so you kind of just discovered this niche in the category. I mean, it wasn't that you set out to do this. You just sort of realized that it was there for the taking. I realized that every other industry that we've operated in, whether it be the food, the beverage, the industrial, the cosmetics, all had a similar course of health and wellness was a not just a trend, but a lifestyle. And sooner or later, it was going to transition into the beverage alcohol world. And that industry moves a little bit slower due to the size and the scale of it. And we were the first and still the first in this category that is huge. And one, two, three percent of this category is a very big number. And we're still set to be the leader. Excellent. I want to talk a little bit about transitions. Uh, at least a couple of you have been part of leadership changes and obviously acquisitions as, as we've touched on. Um, we talked about this briefly. Brett, um, NBC Group, bought Sports Engine in 2016. Um, for Marco, Norwest Equity Partners acquired Marco in 2015. 15. Question for all of you, and maybe we can start with Brett McKinnon. Um, what's the key to navigating these sorts of major transitions successfully? Brett? Yeah, I, I don't think there's a perfect recipe per se. I think there's a little bit of luck involved with this. I can speak about our experience with NBC Sports Group. I, I, I think the real benefit was we share a similar vision of the marketplace and a cultural value system that um, can it help improve our business here in Minneapolis it, it, as well as the rest of the offices we have across the country and that we have some level of freedom to operate and innovate. Uh, I, you know, NBC Sports Group has looked at us as an innovation arm in the digital space in addition to a couple of our sister companies. And so I think that's, that's a benefit where, where we're maybe a little bit lucky in that scenario to be acquired by a great company and have a great partnership there. I think that the internal component of it is it's that kind of running to versus running from uh, philosophy is what are you running to or what's the benefits and the upsides that you're gaining and really focusing your efforts there versus what you feel or sense like you have lost through that. Um, and, and that goes across the board that you have to be uh, vocalizing that from a leadership component. You've got to do it with frontline management group. You have to have a buy-in there. And then finally, I would just say, 
uh, transparency and communication across the group. It, you know, everybody reacts to these scenarios very much differently. And we've always prided ourselves on being a very transparent organization across moves, strategic initiatives, priorities, and financials. And I think that's been a benefit to us and everything I would leverage into the future would be leveraging that transparency within your work groups. That's great. Um, Brett Weiss, what about from the other side? When, when you're acquiring and there's a leadership change for other companies, how, how, do, you, how do you make that smooth? Yeah, it's uh, the, the challenge from our standpoint is making sure that we can get access to those leaders so that we can learn a little bit more about them and how they might fit in our organization. But I think it all comes down to how you treat people. And, you know, if you put yourself in their position and the change that uh, that is going to be embarking upon them and and have a little bit of an appreciation for that, I think it really helps. Um, some of those are successful and some of those are not. And so the key is uh, trying to really get a good fit uh, from a culture standpoint. I think that's what Brett talked about is that that culture piece is so important and, and, and not so much that exactly how you do things, but it's just like what you think and, and how do you treat your staff and, you know, what are those philosophies? Because, you know, we've had an acquisition where I would say it was like a you know, it was like a, a, a battered child syndrome where they didn't treat their staff very well. And we came in and treated them really well, but they never trusted us because they kept thinking that, you know, they should have been treated poorly like they were before. And so that was an odd situation for us to, to really understand and to navigate that. Uh, how do you how do you overcome that? I thought they'd all love us. But as it turned out, they didn't. They they were so accustomed to the way they've been treated. So I think as much due diligence and with, if people don't want to give you some of that due diligence, that should be a red flag. Hmm. Interesting. Um, Jeff, what about your experiences with transitions and, and acquisitions and smart case, You know, I'll take the, um, we sold our company. And when we sold the company, I'd, I'd been on the buy side. So I understood what that equ equation looked like. And, um, you know, you can be a you can be a collaborator or you can be an anti-sponsor. And um, a change is great as long as it's happening to someone else. Uh, but guess what? When you sell your company, it's you. And so having empathy, having, having bought a lot of companies, you knew what good looked like. And so we, we worked hard to make sure that we were collaborators, not anti-sponsors. We worked hard to make sure that we never used the word, well, this is what we've always done, or this is how we've always done it. Those are not good words to be used, by the way. And so the point about team fit, you bet. And so I, I think the, the best advice if you're getting acquired is to recognize that change and to recognize that, you know, it's not gonna be the same. Anybody that says we're not gonna change anything, whether I'm buying someone or getting bought, that's just not true. It's just not true. If there's gonna be change, you might as well accept it, adapt and be a, be a collaborative good leader through the process. Ali, if I could add to that, I, you, know, you brought up a great point, Jeff. The, um, we had a, one of our vendors got acquired and they came in and they made that traditional statement of nothing's going to change. And I'm like, well, that's not true. It, it is going to change. And always so don't good. tell me that it's not going to change because it might change for the better, right? Don't, I'm, don't always assume that it's changing for the worse, but that's the one mistake I think a lot of companies that are being acquired do with their clients is they go in and say, it's not going to change. And that's just not true. Right. Good point. Mark, anything to add to that from your own experiences? Change is constant. Everything, every day. Um, all of our team, we're a family. Uh, a lot of the original people that, that helped me set up the company are still on board today. Every day is different and uh, we're constantly creating, evolving, making it better. And, and what do you do when there's someone who's, you know, joined you thinking you were doing one thing and then you're moving a million miles a minute and suddenly you're in different business? Well, Does there's, everyone come along? Exactly. So you have, you have a couple of different cultures. Uh, you've got the entrepreneur that's able to, you know, create something out of nothing. Then you have the other type of, you know, they need structure and they need um, teams and budgets and that's just not how um, my experience has been with starting companies. Um, quick, flexible, nimble, um, think for yourself, uh, give them support and the tools they need. There's gonna be mistakes, lots of mistakes done. Make sure that you catch them when they're small so they don't become big mistakes that you can't recover from. Great advice. Well, 
we have to talk about the uh, the elephant in the room or in, in all of our rooms since we were meant to be together and here we are on Zoom, COVID-19. It's hit various businesses in, in different ways, but I think we can all agree that it has impacted all of our businesses and, and everything we're doing. Um, let's talk about where it started for each of you if you can remember back what were the first signs for each of you you know that that change was coming or that you needed to to do something and and how did you pivot or or manage things in those early days brett mckinnon you want to start with sports engine sure i, I don't remember the first sign I, I can touch on that professional sports is a leading indicator for our marketplace i, I think the nba the week of that was that Thursday, the March 12th was really the day we effectively mobilized our team to remote. And I can't recall when the NBA announced that they'd be shutting down the season, but that was really the aha moment that said things are changing at a rapid pace and we're not necessarily behind, but we need to move a little bit faster. Um, there's certainly no, no winning solution here. The benefit we've had is we've got plenty of remote offices and remote employees. We have the infrastructure to do these things. And so we're in a really good position to make those adaptations. And then I think, you know, as you look at it, um, looking back, the first signs were there. You saw it. We moved very quickly. And although we were looking to make that mobilization early the next week, we said we've got to make the call now. And then looking back on it, I think the big learning lesson is that uh, the ability to be nimble and pivot that and mobilize where appropriate is you can do a lot faster, small company, big company, et cetera, when you put the force behind it and put a plan together very quickly. While it might not be perfect, it's the best plan you have that day. And when you're doing the right things, you can really make some uh, significant moves. So uh, that, that's been our experience here over the last couple of months. Okay. Uh, Brett Weiss, what about for WSB? What were the first signs and how did you respond? Well, as I said, we tend to lag into any recession or downturn. And so, uh, like a lot of people, I was in that denial mode, hoping that it really wasn't going to happen or be as bad as what everybody thought it was. Um, when, though, uh, it was towards the third week in March, I would say, is that when it really became apparent that it was going to be an issue. And so, um, our COO uh, really went into planning for our team to determine how we wanted to do it. And, you know, we didn't want to spend a ton of time if it wasn't going to be real, but we had to do enough to make sure that we were covered. At the same time, I uh, jumped in on our industry and used the contacts that I have uh, and really used the Minnesota Chamber a lot, if I can plug them a little bit, uh, that they were very helpful during this uh, pandemic to keep try to keep as much business going as we possibly could. And for our industry, having uh, construction staff working, we know how to handle PPE and we know how to stay safe and we're social distancing out there. So there was a lot of work put into that to make sure that uh, things were done in a way to keep as much business as could keep rolling going. And then I worked to mobilize our industry in as, in as many ways as we could. You know, I, I think, you know, when you get into these hard times, the, the easiest thing to do is bury your head in the sand and hope that it goes away, right? And, you know, I'm not saying that I didn't do that too, but at the same time, I was like, well, I, you know, I better do something if it really might happen. And so we put a lot of effort into uh, trying to figure out how, what, how we dealt with this, both with our clients and internally, but then at the same time, what could we do to help lead the business community and our industry forward so that uh, we weren't impacted in, uh, in really uh, bad fashion. And, you know, the hard thing of all of it was to watch all of those businesses that really, you know, through no fault of their own, really took it on the chin. And uh, that's, as a, as a business leader, that's really hard to watch, especially when some of them are your friends and you see what they're going through. And, uh, but you recognize that you just have to keep plugging ahead, stay focused on what it is that you can do and how you can innovate and stay successful like Mark pivoted strong on, on his business and, um, and do what you can to stay alive and, to, you know, live to fight for another day. And that, that's what we've done. And, and uh, I think it's been very successful. That's great. Well, since you brought it up, Brett, let's go to Mark next and then we'll, and then we'll go to Jeff. Mark, talk a little bit about how, I mean, how quickly did you see the, the opportunity in hand sanitizer? How quickly did you feel the, the hit as far as, as the regular business? Certainly. Um, 2019, I did 210 flights, so I basically lived at 33,000 feet 
um, opening up new distribution in, in states um, and international. Uh, one of our biggest um, accounts uh, ordered product in Japan to open up the, the Costco 26 locations in Japan. So December and January, as we were preparing for that, we noticed that there was some delays or hesitation in January because the Asian markets actually felt it first. Um, but in March, uh, when the airports were shutting down and the announcements were made, you know, we were producing about 22 million is our annual production for these spiked ice units that were going out. And immediately when all on-premise shut down with the casinos, the restaurants, the bars, you know, we're looking at lots of alcohol, lots of packaging capacity, the market needs sanitizer and there is no packaging in the US because that all comes in from China. Um, we converted our machines within 24 hours and that very week that everything shut down, we were manufacturing these packets to get out to first responders so they could refill their dispensers that were going empty and then evolved into making these single unit pouches that are going out to you know, the casinos right now, the restaurants, um, Live Nation, when the concert venues reopen, um, we're supplying bulk sanitizer to the, the, the big venues that then can spray down their, um, their facilities. And uh, now since May, June, and July, our uh, sales have picked back up with the chains and the off-premise. And like I said, we're having our best year ever. So we have added an additional revenue stream. So you'll continue to make hand sanitizer? We will. Amazing. Jeff, I remember talking to someone from your team at Marco in the early days back in March, which seems so long ago. Um, and it was the scramble where we were all trying to get set up to work from home. Do you have a printer? How do you sign documents? You know, all of these things. I have to imagine that it was very hectic for Marco very quickly when the stay at home orders were issued. Well, it was an interesting, our, one of our suppliers are headquartered in, in Japan that manufacture a lot of our products over in China. So we got some early indicators, um, which was helpful, but then our president, newly hired president, lives in New Jersey. And we had a new president, a presence out east. So we had a lot of workers in the eastern part of the country, which that got hit early. So we were getting a little feel for what was going on out there. So that was helpful, um, giving us a jump start within 72 hours we were sending our own people home and they were all 1400 of them. And so because we're in the technology business, that, that was a nice early win for us to help our customers, whether they'd been print customers, IT customers, didn't make any difference right now, they were scrambling to get home. And so there was a lot of opportunity there. And to this day, it still remains a, you know, a, a, a highly viable business for us. Um, video conferencing, spiked right up, right? That was a big opportunity for us. We'll continue to execute on that. So some of those remote access products and the video conferencing products, those are something that were, um, I would say, a lesser part of our portfolio and today, very, very strong. On the other hand, what used to be mainstay businesses, I was always proud that education, healthcare, and government made up a big chunk of our customers. All of a sudden, those are three that are getting impacted big time. Like you never thought that would ever happen. And so access to those buildings, once that was shut down, you know, our copy or repair people, that kind of, that kind of, um, that, that part of our business went to, you know, really got, really got hit hard. We had to furlough about 400 people, but I was glad that we were very decisive early. I was also glad we had a lot of contracted services. And so that's a, a good case for recurring revenue streams. And uh, we built that into a strategy years before. So today, as we exit, um, you know, as, or I shouldn't say exit, but as we transition and get more used to some of the COVID activities, um, that doesn't even sound good, does it? Um, but as we get more used to that um, and people are coming back to work, we're doing that a little bit slower, but, but some of the, the strength in some of those businesses has, has remained very, very strong. We're in good shape. So, um, and just one follow up, Brett, I mean, or Jeff, do you see new opportunities coming out of this? Have you, have you identified new businesses? And I'll, I'll let you start and if anyone else wants to jump in as well. Well, I think that security became a big deal. Um, security was always part of the network landscape, but all of a sudden people are sitting in their own house with their own networks. And so for us, that became an immediate concern. 
for CEOs and probably the people that are on the, on the uh, panel here with me today, because all of a sudden you had different points of entry. You had cameras now, you had security systems at home now that run home networks. And so security was always a big deal, but it instantly became a really, really big deal. And so that's something that we'll continue to, to, to capitalize on and uh, to build out that practice. Great. Anything yeah, I else? Would, uh, yeah, I, I would add that, you know, as I mentioned, uh, we've had to find ways to compete against some of the larger, more established competitors over the years. And um, one of the things that we really leaned into is technology and software. And, you know, our industry has been a little slow to adapt to that at times. But we've developed a lot of programs ourselves, and we haven't necessarily had as much success as we would have liked from having our customers take those on and look into those. Now with, uh, you know, people using Zoom and realizing that uh, technology is important, we've had a lot more interest in some of those uh, technology solutions that we have and how we can deploy those. So I think that's been, that's been a real positive for us uh, to come out of this. It's not going to be a game changer, but, you know, you start to get them introduced, uh, gives you a chance with other people as well. Great. Um, anything new for Sports Engine co coming out of this? Any have you identified any services or products? Yeah, we have. I, I think um, we're not we're, we're not quite there. We've got a number of active discussions in flight with uh, third parties right now, whether they're on the M and A front or just as integrated type partners. But I think the the net is that the the U Sport organization will most likely evolve at a much more rapid pace uh, in their uses of technology and we're seeing that across all segments of our market and that means a, a bunch of different things right it's it's how do we collect information how do we collect payments it's how do we absorb video and how do we leverage video so there's a number of areas of investment that i think are being expedited either internally or externally uh, based on what we see the evolving landscape looking like okay so we've talked about how you keep the, the, the business rolling and make sure that you don't take a, a huge hit in when there's a downturn. What about leading the humans? What, what about your teams? And it's a stressful time and suddenly everybody is at home and you can't even necessarily be in the same room with them. What are your strategies? What advice do you all have as, as leaders to leading through crisis? Brett Weiss, do you wanna start? Well, yeah, I, you know, I was fortunate years ago to play football for Lou Holtz and um, he was the supreme motivator, right? And, and guy that would, uh, would keep people rolling. So I've taken to, you know, making sure that I'm communicating either through video or through emails with our staff. And we've just really tried to be very, you know, transparency is an overused word, but we've just really tried to be honest with our staff about what is going on. And the reality early on where we said, you know, this feels a little bit like the Great Recession and that wasn't good for our industry. And these are some of the things that happened. And so here's what we need you to do and what we need you to focus on. And so our message all along has been, worry about the things that you can control and don't worry about the things that you can't control. And then that will make you feel a lot better about what's going on. We will let you know we are going to do everything in our power to protect our staff, to protect our clients, and to make sure that we are successful. And that's what we did through the recession. And when we came out of the recession, we were on a rocket ship because we had been so good to our staff. We hope that that will be the same here. But at the same time, we need them to focus on their jobs, to do the things. Don't put us in a position where we're not going to be successful because you're you know, spending too much on a project or you're not getting back to your clients or you're making errors. And so just trying to communicate and talk to our staff on a regular basis and with the staff that have never experienced the recession or at least experienced it as a younger person, not as a working person, you know, it's letting them know what things did we do that were successful back then and how does that apply now? But I will tell you that uh, this is the challenge of this is that you've got people on both ends of the spectrum and everything in between. And, you know, that's okay. Everybody has different feelings about, you know, their fears and concerns about this and the economy and their jobs and their, their parents and whatever else. And so that is a huge challenge. And we've just tried to continue to communicate and put ourselves out there and let them know that we're fine. We're going to be fine. We're going to find our way through this. Don't worry about this part. Uh, just focus on the things that you need to Lou Holtz always said, um, 
you know, uh, focus on what you need to focus on right now, right? Uh, when is what he always said, and it stood for what's important now. And I think that's, that's really what we need, each of us need to do, so. That's great. Um, Mark, how, how big is your team at, at Drake's and, and how, are you, how are you working? Are people at home and, and how are you navigating that leadership role? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, in the alcohol industry, you have distributors that um, your alcohol has to go through. But on our scale, we have more capacity than Tito's and Grey Goose combined. So we have a, uh, a huge supply chain, but on our team side, you know, we've built this company with less than a dozen people. And, um, you know, we, we just keep moving forward because if, if you're not moving forward, somebody else is going to pass you. And um, somebody else had said the, um, you know, when fear hits, a lot of people will bury their head in the sand and hope that, you know, it just goes by. But we just keep moving. And every day there's a new task, um, a new challenge, and our people rise to the challenge and keep going. I've heard a lot of CEOs and, and founders say they've never worked harder than during this pandemic, that it's, it's like back to the, the early startup days. Do you feel that way? A thousand percent. But we work hard anyways. It's just <laughs> there's other things to work harder on and more of them. But yeah, it's, it, for entrepreneurs, it's fantastic because there's more challenges and you either figure it out or you don't. And we get it done. We figure it out. Brett McKinnon, how is the sports engine team navigating? How are you all? Is everybody still at home? And, and, and how, do you, how do you keep the team together and collaborate during this time? Yeah, I'm, I'm willing to take tips from just about anybody at this point. Uh, yeah, we're still fully distributed. I anticipate and forecast we will be for some time as a division of the sports group. We, we work closely with them on what's local precedent versus what we're seeing in other office. But we are at home. You see it here. I'm in my room and I'll be here. Um, I think, you know, we've certainly tried different tactics. We talked about communication. We talk a lot around silence being deafening, whether you have a perfect plan or not communication and consistent communication and open communication is, is really a key component of that. I think what will become interesting and what we're really focusing on is how does this system evolve as being more distributed over the next two to five years? And how do you repeat those common connections you had when you were commonly in a, in a in office type work environment. The thing I personally miss the most and I try to replicate the most, but which is the hardest work is those two minute touch points. That's very hard to do over Zoom, Google Hangouts or other mediums. And, and those are very meaningful touch points. I think along the day, you absorb a lot of information, you gain value from those interactions. And I don't think we're really used to accustoming or accustomed to interacting this way. And so I think the team's in a good spot overall. They would be the ones to tell you that. Um, we'll be here for a bit. And I think we're really focused on like, how do we do this? And maybe some simple tactics is we stop doing some Zoom meetings that we're doing, get in your car, walk around and have a conversation as opposed to trying to just replicate this each and every day, you know, person to person. So I think we're, we're working through all of those tactics. Sounds good. Jeff, you have such a calming, reassuring presence. How are you making your team feel okay when they're all dispersed and working at home? We've got about 1,400 team members, so it's, it's pretty extensive. The states that we're in, you know, Iowa, South Dakota, North Dakota, uh, Nebraska, some of them had different um, approaches because of the sheer size of their states and the, and the population. So some of those stayed pretty open along the way and they kind of have, but then we really got hammered out in the, um, in the East Coast. And of course, um, you know, here in, here, here in Minnesota hasn't been that easy, but this is where you leverage your culture. And um, having been through four or five different recessions or some version of crisis now, you can call, well, they're all kind of a crisis if things aren't working as planned. And this certainly was, is qualifies. But this is where you leverage a good culture. And so if, you, if you've invested in the soft stuff inside your organization consistently, this is where you get an opportunity to, to you've earned the trust. And certainly communication, consistent communication. Um, I'm doing a video tomorrow, one of our quarterly updates. I do a lot of videos right now. Um, we leverage our own collaboration tools. And, and again, frequency, I think that's all been stated. Is, is very, very helpful and, and it's consistent with how we communicated in the past. Another thing I think right now that, that comes into play is you got to have some empathy toward the, the, the family piece. I know it's a soft part, but all of a sudden people are, 
but teaching their kid, their their homeschooling kind of, and they're and they're and they're at home and maybe the, a, a less conducive workplace, and they left. And so, recognizing some of those limitations, I think, was important, and and making it okay if you couldn't make that meeting, or making it okay if the dog barks. I had one today, and I was with a, somebody from the Twin Cities actually, and it was a it was a supplier and or a customer, and he had a red a baby red squirrel on his um his deck. That was a new one. When he goes, Adam, distracted right now. There's a baby red squirrel on my deck, and I thought, see, that's just fine, right? So yeah, that's part of that. That's part of the soft stuff that goes into making the hard decisions that you have to make along the way. And so I think empathy went, went, went a long way. Strong culture goes a long way. And that's what it pays for itself. And when in doubt, a drink helps, right, Mark? <laughs> drink. <laughs> Especially a frozen Hard one. Hard to argue with that, yeah. yeah. Did you get yeah. my address yet, Mark? Just send me my <laughs> We have some questions from our audience, some really good ones I want to get to briefly. We have just a few minutes left, but, but before we do that, I just want to touch on talent and diversity. Let's start with WSB. Brett, you introduced a program that I was so impressed with. I, I wrote about it in my editor's note this month in Twin Cities Business. Um, and it's all about expanding your own talent pool and kind of taking matters into your own hands. Can you talk just a little bit about that? Yeah, that was very nice of you to uh, to give us some publicity on that. We're really proud of it. Our industry is not very diverse. And the challenge is, I believe, is that we don't have as many role models. People need to see somebody that looks like them working in that industry. And we need to change. And that needs to, to improve. And so we just decided that we have a segment of our organization that we were training people anyway. And so we made a focus to train um, people from underrepresented communities. And we graduated nine, nine uh, students this year. And we're really excited about that. We hired two of those. Uh, we would have hired more had we not uh, been in this COVID situation, but we're working hard to get uh, some of the others placed. The thing that I was most satisfied about this program and the lady who runs it for us does a wonderful job. And, um, but every one of those students said, whether or not I work in your industry or not, by going through this program, and it taught me something about myself that I can do anything and I can find a career that is, that is good for me. And that made me feel really good. And obviously, we want them in our industry, and we're gonna we're planning our next uh, cohort right now. Uh, but we're gonna keep doing that, and uh, and hopefully build some diversity inside our organization, our industry. And then hopefully, what happens is that those people that are working for us, those staff that are working for us in our industry, will uh, be an inspiration to others to maybe go to school for a science degree or an engineering degree, and they'll say, hey, there is an area that I can work and and be a part of. So we're really proud of it. We figured that it was time for somebody to do something about it. And uh, so we stepped forward and we've been working on it for a while and we didn't get to finish it as much as we would have liked because of COVID. Uh, but we're really proud of those students that, uh, that went through the program. That's great. And we should say, I mean, that that effort and that that all started long before recent events yes. and, and George yeah. Floyd and, and all of yeah. that really well timed. Um, anybody else? I don't want to put you on the spot, but but any other thoughts just on talent development? Obviously, really important for growth companies. Uh, we were at a really low unemployment rate heading into to this uh, pandemic. It's a little different now. How do you how do you how do you think now about talent and, and diversity and developing your workforce? Brett, any thoughts for Sports Engine? Yeah, certainly. I have a little technical issue, so I'm back here coming in mid-flight. All good. Uh, yeah, I think the concept that, that we're focused a lot on, certainly there's programs that we had in the past and that we're doubling down on, and those things are all really important, is, is really a system of intentionality versus accountability, is what are the things you're trying to achieve and how do we objectively define those goals. But furthermore, it's really creating pathways for our team to engage with us mm -hmm. in the way they want to. And I think the, the common way we communicate them is meet customers or meet people where they, where they want to meet. Um, and, and that's a big component of this is, is, is mobile is engaging our, our diverse workforce in a way that, that makes sense to them and, and making sure that we're a great representation of the communities that we serve and the communities that we live within. And so I think we're, we'd all be missing the boat if we weren't saying we were doubling down in some capacity. Um, and so, yeah, it's certainly a huge focus to us both on the acquisition side, but retention and development as well. Okay. Any other thoughts on that topic, Jeff or Mark? Well, we, I, I would add, find something different. Um, 
probably less than a year ago or so, we to, to try to do a better job of, of, of treating each other well inside our organizations. Our organization, we started a, a training curriculum around um, respectful workplace, you know, and, and, and using that term. And that was very successful. But as, as things kind of played out recently with some of the unrest relating to race, um, we're, we're launching a new um, program. That's not really a program, but it's called, it's on biases to, to more about how you, how you think about others, not just how you, uh, you know, treat each other, but how you think about others. And so our managers will go through that. It's, it's um, in fact, we've got a great instructor. It's actually my wife, who's a, an attorney here in, in St. Cloud. And, um, and she's gonna be, um, all of our employees will be going through that. Some will be opt-in, some will be mandatory, but people were looking for a statement. It's hard to make a statement. It's kind of lose-lose on that. And so we do what we, what we like to do best is include everybody in uh, exposing them to, you know, a, a more collective way to approach it. So I'm looking forward to our, our training on that and it'll, it'll, that'll, that'll send a statement too. It'd be, it'd be a good one. Sounds good. Um, all right, I'm gonna jump uh, so we can get to a couple of these uh, questions from our audience. Thank you everybody for, for listening and for the good questions. Um, Michaela wants to know, and maybe Mark, you can, can start us off. What advice do you have for uh, people who are running a small business and looking to shift into new markets due to the pandemic? Any advice? Don't be afraid to make a mistake. Just realize that um, you know, catch it early before it becomes big. Um, but yeah, you got to take risks. And that's when you discover what can be done and you push it to the limit and then a little bit past and then pull it back and just don't be afraid. Any other words of wisdom from our other panelists as far as new markets or new opportunities because of the pandemic? Brett Weiss, I feel like you well, have. I yeah, I was just going to say that I think it becomes a, you know, if you listen to Mark talk a little bit and the other panelists, we are always looking for new ways to do things. And so what gives Mark that ability is that he's constantly thinking about those. And that's the same with us. So we've been able to launch a few things, but we've been working on those for a while. So uh, you can look for those. I think his advice is really good. But my advice to you is don't don't think about it just in this pandemic. Think about it as a lifestyle with your business to constantly be trying to invent and look for those things because it has to be a part of your culture. And I, you know, I I would just say that you know a little, uh, if I can give a little bit of advice to people right now, on this too. Um, be careful with how much you cut. I think right now that what when people read a book they say. Uh, I just need to cut a whole bunch of stuff, right? I need to cut salaries or I need to cut this or cut that. And sometimes you can cut so deep that it impacts your business in a negative way. So it looks like you save some money, but you actually cost yourself a lot of money. And so I would just be very cautious as you do that, right? Marketing, uh, staff development, even, you know, and I, not to push the chamber, but even chamber memberships or those, those memberships that are important to your organization, they need you right now as well. And if you cut them at this point, then that weakens them in their ability to help you going forward. And so I just think there's too much of that, right? Where people just, uh, and maybe the other panels can say that, but that's been my experience is be really careful getting too aggressive on chopping all expenses. It's a really good point. Any other uh, parting words of wisdom on, on how, to, how to get through this time and, and how to innovate and, and think growth during this time? We've said it all. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, we, uh, we'll take just one more of the, uh, the questions. Jeff, this seems like a perfect one for you. Um, we have a listener who wants to know how you maintain your, you talked about culture. How do you maintain that culture when people are home? How do you continue to foster support and encouragement for your employees um, and just think about all of their needs while we're all on this roller coaster? I think it gets back to a little bit about empathy again, is to recognize that um, they ended up in a place, we all ended up in a place we didn't think we were going to in pretty short order. And so it wasn't like we got to set up our home office and make it totally conducive. There's some pretty fun things I think we've all seen is how people have had makeshift 
offices and made it work. I think some of the things that we tried to do, we all had, I'll just call it budgets for lack of a better term and a little bigger company for how we engage with our employees. And so how do you do it different? One of the things we did recently, and, and, and they're kind of clever, I thought, everybody got up, you know, who'd have thought this back in January, but everybody got a, a Marco mask that was nicely made and looked decent, went to their home. And then there was a, um, or um, they had some Johnny Pop ice cream bar things in there that they were, that they were given, you know, a coupon to redeem. So just a funny little thing about, hey, thinking about you, you know, get, you're gonna, you know, you gotta, we had mass shortages, we got one, have a Johnny Pop. I don't know why, but it, it connects. And so thinking of ways to connect that you didn't traditionally do and then actually doing them. I think a lot of it too was um, that using video, you know, we're doing it right now, but using video was something that I, I thought, you know, we did pretty well before, but, but frequency of it. I, I just think that the um, genuine communication with our with our with our remote workers became paramount, and right. um, so I don't know frequency, consistency, catch them off guard in a good way, and keep updating them on on progress reports with transparency. Right. When in doubt, sweets help, and uh, I think we're all ready to to crack open a drink, right, Mark? <laughs> Absolutely. Drink breaks. <laughs> Well, thank you all. Thanks to everybody for, for listening today. I want to thank our sponsors, especially um, RSM and our promotional partner, ACG Minnesota, for making this event possible. Special thanks to our panelists for pivoting with us on, on the date and on going virtual. Mark Anderson, Jeff Gao, Brett McKinnon, and Brett Weiss, you all have so much great advice. We really appreciate you sharing your insights today. Um, if you have friends and colleagues who you think might benefit from this, good news will be online. This webinar will be available at tcbmag.com along with all of our other TCB talks. Um, you'll look for that in the next a day or so. Thank you again for joining us. Thanks to all of you. Thank you, panelists. Such a pleasure to talk Thank to you. you. Have a great fun. day, everybody. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Thank Thanks you, everybody. everybody.